Good evening, everyone. It's uh, poetically fitting on this week where the world received the United Nations report on climate change that we here on a local level here in Lexington uh, bring in a world-class scholar uh, and an outstanding environmental Jewish theologian uh, and Dr. Mara Benjamin. Um, it's a pleasure to see all of you come out and support this program. The Moosnik Lecture is a highlight of each and every year. It's great to uh, not only have the program once again, uh, but to um, have the program again in person. Um, I want to acknowledge um, all of the institutions and all of the committee members who put in the uh, hard work and the preparation to bring this program to you. I want to thank Carol Barnsley and uh, Leslie Ribovich of uh, Transylvania University. I um, also want to um, acknowledge from Lexington Theological, Wilson Dickinson and Lloyda Martel. Uh, from Mojave Zion, our partner congregation in town, um, thank you to Rabbi Shania Bronwitz and to Professor Beth Goldstein, also uh, want to acknowledge the hard work of, uh, of uh, Charlene Harris at Transylvania University um, for putting in um, all the effort to um, offer this program to you. Blessed are you, eternal our God, ruler of the universe, creator of all things. Amen. Um, with that, I want to call forward for the um, official welcome representing uh, the Musnick family. Nora Rose Moosnick, better known as Rosie.
very different. We were facing, perhaps one could say we were facing the same challenges, but we didn't recognize those. They went unrecognized or uh, they weren't as pressing. And so some of the challenges that we're gonna discuss tonight with um, Dr. Benjamin is the climate crisis and how that interfaces with racism, classism, sexism, and in the state, transphobia. And I would add to that, geographic privileging, because anyone who's from Kentucky knows that we are a disparaged landscape, especially if you hail from Eastern Kentucky. But I would like to think that in all these challenges, there are possibilities and opportunities, that there's the opportunity to interrogate our moral compass, and for many of us, that moral compass is outlined by our religious tradition, be it Judaism or some other tradition. And I know that having heard Dr. Benjamin last night, I know she's going to uh, give us a lively conversation and she may lead us to answers. More likely, she'll probably lead, um, I don't know, lead us to questions, which is probably more appropriate with Passover on the horizon. But when we engage as a community in these challenges, be it the trees that just came down, what is it, two weeks ago, or any challenges that we're going to face in the future. When we engage in them as a community, we honor the memory of Warren Franklin, my father, but we also honor the memory of so many others in this community who are devoted to this community and maybe don't have a lecture series codified in their name, but the gate to this community. Theology 
um, in Judaism, but does so with a really careful, critical eye, um, aware of the field of religious studies and aware of what's going on in other religious traditions. And she takes that into account in her work, and she is deeply invested in ethical questions. And um, she's also a fabulous, uh, fabulous person who builds community wherever she she finds herself. So um, please join me in welcoming her and um, just having the opportunity to learn from her tonight. And uh, after the presentation, we'll have time for some question and answer. If you can uh, rise at your spot uh, and project loudly so they can hear you, not only uh, throughout this uh, space, but out there in the Zoom land, that would be much appreciated. Um, thank you so much for the really warm introduction, um, Professor Sippy, um, and uh, Rabbi Wurschafer, and I know there are so many other people who made this evening possible. Um, Rosie and your family, of course, who you mentioned, um, Dr. Ripovich, um, Charlene Harris, uh, you know, and, and many others behind the scenes. So I, I'm very grateful. I'm gr very grateful to be back, um, being able to teach in person and um, be in conversation with you. Uh, this project is very much in development, and um, so I'm sharing some thoughts for now, and I'm, I am excited to learn from you as well. Um, I also want to make mention of my study partner, my Chavruta, um, Judith Glasgow, who, uh, who has been with me every step of this journey um, on this new project. So um, thank you to, to all of these um, so many of us may agree that the climate crisis raises profound practical challenges, right? There are the political challenges of how countries with vastly different resources and practices and modes of social, social organization can work together to address a set of problems that affect us differentially, um, in particular people with the least political power. Um, there are technological challenges, of course, of inventing ways to live in the world that don't result in its becoming a wasteland that can no longer support life. There's economic elements. There are so many different pieces of this crisis that need to be thought through and that need our attention, all of us, from wherever we sit. Um, I'm a, a person who likes to think about religion, uh, religious ideas, ultimate questions. Um, Theology is not always a word that is, uh, I don't know, relatable, shall we say, to many people. But uh, that, to me, is where the most important questions happen. And so from where I sit, what I see is a crisis of sense-making. Um, the climate catastrophe calls into question our conceptual apparatuses, the basic but often somewhat invisible lenses through which we interpret the world. Um, for instance, and I, I understand this is um, a very close, proximate set of um, issues that are on everyone's mind in different ways, and here in the ways we just mentioned around the, the extreme winds and flooding. Um, if you think of the category of events that used to often be called, and sometimes still are called, natural disasters, right? What we have usually called natural disasters are things that, that are clearly beyond our control. Um, these are the same events that insurance companies call acts of God, interestingly enough. Um, but now we're living with wildfires, hurricanes, tornadoes, other violent weather events, with new frequency and new intensity. And we know that while none of those particular events is directly linked or directly in control, I should say, of any particular person or group of people or all of humanity, they are also traceable and tethered to human activity. So they're not acts of God, at least not in the uh, sort of theology of the insurance company, um, meaning completely unpredictable random events, and they're not just nature doing its thing. We know this, right? So how are we supposed to think about this kind of reality that we're facing? This is where, to my mind, the, what I think of as kind of the conceptual furniture um, of our world, our mental maps, um, is something that we uh, that either helps us or hinders us in informing our actions and in helping us make sense of this. To me, this is 
because I'm interested in religious thought, but also I'm hoping to convince you that this is where things get interesting and where many questions start to take shape, right? So what exactly is theology? What should theology be in an era of climate change? In other words, how ought to we to conceive of the world, right? Which I know that might not be sort of um, just uh, another way of saying the same thing, but go with me here, right? How ought we think about the world and its inhabitants and what it means to be him? How should we think not only about acts of God, but about God? What about nature? Is there such a thing anymore? Was there ever such a thing as this category called nature? And how do these ideas of each of these terms inform our understanding of who we humans are in this very disorienting time? So I'm a scholar of Jewish thought, as um, Suzuki mentioned. Um, I'm interested in analyzing what Jewish philosophers and religious thinkers have said and have thought and how they've adapted and adopted ways of thinking um, because of being in various different places and time periods, right? Being the condition of being a diasporic people in, let's say, the Roman Empire or being part of the Enlightenment um, in you know, Central European countries or colonialism right, in different instantiations. I'm interested in evaluating, not only studying, but also evaluating how the ways of thinking and understanding that Jews have developed in these different times and places um, may limit as well as help our being in the world in our moment. So tonight I want to talk about how we ought to think of this, or how, not really, I, I have to tell you, sorry, um, to spoil this, but I'm not going to tell you how we ought to think, but I, I want to think with you about um, how we ought to navigate being in the world. Um, this is a situation we face as humans, as living organisms, as people in the contemporary West, and at least for many of us in the room tonight, not everybody, but as Jews, right? Or perhaps as people with attachment to some kind of, uh, let's say, monotheistic religious tradition or a religious community um, of some sort. And I'll tell you here at the outset that I have a bit of an axe to grind, because in fact there have been remarkably few Jewish theologians or philosophers or other kinds of religious thinkers who seem to be bothered by this crisis in theological terms. Many of us are bothered, but it sort of gets compartmentalized. And um, there are not a lot, uh, the, the work that has um, existed today, I think, goes with existing frameworks that I don't think uh, are so easy to kind of continue with in this moment. So um, just to say that I understand Jewish theological reflection to be expansive and dynamic and multivocal, right? It's not one thing. I, it doesn't just exist in text, right? It's performed and enacted and, um, you know, it's something that we see in ritual life and in how we act toward one another. And yet, I do think, and I'm happy to, uh, to talk more about this if we're interested, that even by the most broad definitions of what theology is, right, as diverse in form and genre as it could be, I think the attempt to integrate knowledge of this catastrophe that's already underway into Jewish theology has really fairly begun. And moreover, of the discourse that I encounter in, uh, in Jewish context, I think a lot of the approach has been one of, what do Jewish sources have to say about ecological crisis? I think that's the wrong question. I think the question that we should be asking is, what does ecological crisis say to us? How does it interrogate some of the ways that we as Jews or others have made sense of the world? Now, um, you know, as someone in Jewish studies, but I think beyond that, you know, there's this kind of predisposition to um, to think about anything in terms of like Jews. So, you know, the elephant and the Jewish problem or whatever, right? Like it's sort of, you can you can put Jews at the center. And I don't want to say that, um, that Jewish thought is at the center of this problem, but I think rather that um, our world being reformed and coming apart um, addresses us. So we have a responsibility to take this reality seriously and to be curious and willing to engage with other constructions of the world that, that might be, to be critical of structures of thought that are problematic or that limit us. And um, 
um, to be willing to call into question the things that we have accepted and live in the tension between this is immensely larger than us on the one hand, and this is who we are over here, right? How do we talk about this, you know, immense uh, issue that we're facing with myriad different manifestations? How do we show up as Jews, right? And again, I don't presume everyone in this audience is uh, Jewish, but I'm speaking in a Jewish space, and I'm speaking, of course, as a someone with a lot of attachment to Jewish tradition as well as being a scholar of it. Um, so uh, the kinds of things that I want to illustrate in terms of the way that this crisis addresses us um, includes ideas about who humans are vis-a-vis -vis non human beings and presences, um, about a God that must be distinct from the earthly plane, if not utterly transcendent, and ideas about the world in which it's mostly the st stable and passive backdrop for human affairs. Modern Jewish thought and theology builds on ancient and medieval conceptual structures and in some cases really calcifies some of these ancient ideas, such that you have someone like Franz Rosenzweig, who uh, Professor Sippy mentioned, right, a great early 20th century uh, Jewish philosopher, making a kind of um, grand, grand philosophy that's organized around these three concepts, these three pillars, God, human being, and the world. Human being and the world and God, these are all kind of equivalent in weight, right? So what about not just God, human, and world, but rock and lichen and bacterium and owl, right, and all of these other beings? So, um, the concept of nature, and I spoke more about this last night, um, uh, anyway, yes, <laughs> so some of you are there. Um, that concept of nature has been exposed as a fantasy, right? As the notion that we are living um, against the backdrop of nature is starting to seed, I think, uh, to the notion that we are living in a world as part of this world, right? So I want to share, again, some of these ideas for Jewish frameworks, uh, how they're called into question, and to really think with you about this presumption that we find in many places of humans as distinctive in having a subject position, right? in, in being able to be a fully realized subject. Um, I want to talk through a few ways this shows up in different Jewish narratives and share some alternative ways of imagining being part of the world. Um, and my hope is that we can develop new ways of thinking about what it means to be human and become more earthbound, because only earthbound beings can really face these unfolding catastrophe affecting all earthbound life. So, um, Let's talk for a moment about why we use stories or texts from our tradition as one of these sources. Um, Robin Wallkimmer, who's a botanist and a, a writer and a member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation, writes, cosmologies are a source of identity and orientation to the world. They tell us who we are. We are inevitably shaped by them, no matter how distant they, be, they may be from our consciousness. And that's the spirit in which I want to take us back to some familiar narratives and look at them anew with lenses informed by the reality of ecological changes that are so catastrophic. So Jewish stories, just to be clear, I, I noted that there isn't one single story, there isn't one single set of myths, but they present to us several versions of a cosmic ecosystem. Um, they, they set different elements of the world in relation to one another and name those different elements into being. They encode an understanding of why there is a world at all and how it should be organized and the purpose of, this way of, of its way of being and what happens when that order breaks. Uh, so let's touch down on a few places, um, some of the creation stories, and then other texts that we might think of as kind of inviting for thinking about ecological catastrophe, including the story of Noah and um, some of our texts that show up in liturgy. Um, scholars of biblical literature 
understand the opening chapters of Genesis to contain two accounts that differ, differ from one another in many important details. And most scholars attribute these differences to there being two different schools of authorship, right? The priestly school of authorship, which gives us Genesis 1, and the Yahweh school of authorship, which gives us Genesis 2. Um, and the different circumstances under which each group of authors or scribes more likely produced the Torah helps us understand some of the key differences in how these accounts portray what it means to be a human in the world. But for all of the differences, and there are many of them, between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, and these two versions of the human creation story, there's this point of commonality, which is that human being is understood to be a special category of creation in being the only one with a subject position. And what I mean by subject position is one that you can sort of imagine it having a point of view, will, agency, right? This is the one where if you're a subject, you get to define the terms, right? And other things are defined by the subject. So Genesis 1 portrays a human being as distinguished by this hierarchical relationship to the rest of creation. It's positioned as the apex of God's creation. So in this case, um, unlike other, we can imagine other myths, right, where the human is created last, so that might tell you, oh, wow, the wet behind the ears, and they might need to like pay attention to the other beings that have been here for a while. But that's not quite how being last works in Genesis 1. Rather, it's the kind of culmination, right? It's the apex. And this human being is subordinated only to God, and it is placed in a position of authority relative to the rest of creation, right? And this verse, uh, famous verse, uh, uh, Puravu, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, and all living things that crawl about on the earth. Right? So the human being stands out. In the second narrative, as I said, for many different, different, di many of the ways that it's different, um, that this authorship and school of authorship shows up as different, um, it also imagines humans as exceptional, and in this sense that human beings are subjects who are also, um, I like to think of it as partially terrestrial, right? They're partly earthly, but the other part is kind of extraterrestrial. <laughs> um, so here are, here are some of the words that I'll, I'll want to think about with you. When the Lord God made the heaven and earth, when no shrub of the field was yet on the earth, and no grasses of the field had yet sprouted, because the Lord God did not send rain upon the earth, and there was no human to till the soil, but a globe would well up from the ground and water the whole surface of the earth, the Lord God formed the, the human being, Adam, from the dust of the earth, Adama. They were. He blew into his nostrils the breath of life, and the human being became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden of Eden in the east and placed there the human being whom he had formed. Okay, so just a couple little things that I want to pull out. There's obviously centuries and centuries of commentary on, on each uh, letter here, but just a few, a few things. So the first is that all plant life exists only in this potential state until the human being is created, right? No plant of the field was yet in the earth, and no, field, no herb of the field had yet grown for two reasons. The Lord God did not cause it to rain upon the earth, and there was no human till the ground. So rain is needed for plant life, but in this story, so are humans. There is no plant life without humans, right? So the implication being that the rest of the world, the plant world, is there because we came along to, you know, till it and tend it. The earth creature, here's the second point. The earth creature, or Adam, right, is named because it's made of Adama, clay, or soil. And yet, it says, to go back up here, that the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east and placed the man whom he had formed. And this verb to place, or really to set down, um, is a really odd verb to use if this creature is made of Adama, right? You don't think it would have to like, go anywhere, right? It's actually already Adama, but somehow, God is going to place it there. And more, uh, you know, one, one last thing to, to lift up from this is that the human creature is a living being, right? And the, the Hebrew for that is a nefesh chaya, a living being. Uh, 
transcription, which is also applied to the other animals. But unlike them, the human being's animacy is what I would call an aftermarket feature. In the sense that, right, um, the Lord God poured the human uh, dust on the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the human being became a living soul, right? So it's not on account of the fact that this being is formed of the earth that makes it animate. So let's think this out for a moment. It means that that idea implies that the Adama, the earth, is lifeless and passive and inert, dead matter. Right? So there's this thing that comes from above, the breath of God, which comes from the outside, that animates that passive dead matter. Okay? So that's why I think that the human being is sort of partly terrestrial, but partly extraterrestrial outside of the, the, the land and the world. So taken together, these two creation accounts portray humans as exceptional creatures in their capacity for a relationship with God, for being made in the image of God, for being tasked with working the land, right? But they're not fully, um, they're not fully earthbound, and being not earthbound is associated with having a subject position, right? Um, these ancient stories show up in all kinds of ways, right, that tell us that we are extraterrestrial. We're not merely animal. We're not merely Earth. And that, that ad, adverb, merely? Uh, yeah, it's an adverb. And we're not merely, that, that sort of suggests that that would be a unfortunate thing, to, to just be Earth, right? Because the Earth is, as I said, and inert, and doesn't have a point of view. Um, uh, the, the topic I, I spoke about last night is this idea of stewardship, which is really rooted in this and has kind of taken hold in many environmental religious organizations. Now, somebody that I had lunch with today rightly pointed out that this notion of stewardship, of being responsible for creation, actually would be a huge advance in many places, right? Um, that's, that's great if your main mode of being is extractive, right? Um, however, it's, it's also a problem because it reinforces the perception that we are not part of the world, that we're not earthly, right? Um, so that brings us to this second key idea, right? That rest of the world. Now, I imagine that many of us here tonight have thought about Jewish texts having a fairly robust conception of the way that human sin, right, um, or the sin of the people of Israel has repercussions in the natural world, right? Perhaps the story of Noah and the ark comes to mind, right? Why does the flood happen? I mean, the simple reading of the text, um, contextual reading, would be that um, human sin, violence, becomes so great that God is going to bring about a natural disaster, quote unquote, blood to wipe it out, right? And there we understand, we're supposed to understand that natural disaster is absolutely an act of God, but not in the way the insurance companies mean it, right? <laughs> they mean it's a very deliberate act of punishment by God to eradicate sin, right? Plenty of residents there, and I'm going to imagine that uh, there have been sermons, there have been other opportunities to think about the story as a very resonant text for this moment. Um, hold that in your mind for a moment and think now of the Shema. Right? It, traditionally, the Shema is recited twice a day in the, in the liturgy, and it comes, uh, the paragraph I want to quote comes from the book of Deuteronomy. So here, tell me if this doesn't sound like a very tempting text to you moment. If then you obey the commandments I enjoin upon you this day, this is God talking, loving the, or, sorry, Moses talking, loving the Lord your God and serving him with all your heart and soul, I will grant rain for the land in season, the early rain and the late rain. You shall gather in your new grain and wine and soil, right? That, that's the if that. If you obey the commandments, then you get all of this, right? Take care not to be lured away to serve other gods and bow down to them. For if you do, the Lord's anger will flare up against you, and he will shut up the skies so that there will be no rain, and the ground will not yield its produce, and soon you will perish from the good land that the Lord is assigning to you. I mean, that's like, wow, I see. Human sin is causing God to inflict this punishment, right? And those of us who are maybe not so sure about the God piece can say, well, okay, just like leave that God piece out and just say, look, the 
consequence of human sin is here, right? Further on, not in Shema, but in the, uh, the curses, as it were, of Deuteronomy, if you do not hearken to the Lord, to the voice of the Lord your God, by taking care and by observing all of his commandments and his laws that I command you today, then there will come upon you all of these curses and overtake you. Here's just a couple choice curses. The heavens that are above your head will become bronze, and the earth that is beneath you iron. God will make the rain of your land powder and dust. From the heavens it will come down upon you until you're wiped out. Okay? Again, um, you know, with intense flooding, intense winds, intense heat, it sounds like these curses are actually coming to pass, right? I mean, doesn't that sound correct? But what I want to focus on here is the set of relations between God and humans in which the earth is just a mediating force. This is the part that concerns me. The earth in this, in these narratives, all of these cases I just showed you, um, is an instrument through which God makes God's displeasure known to people. So that means the real relationship is between God and humans in general, or God and the people of Israel, and the earth and its many other inhabitants get eclipsed. It's many other beings get eclipsed, right? They kind of become like collateral damage, if anything. So this set of relations you can find in many, many places in Torah. There are a few, and again, here, Deuteronomy is a different author. The priestly school, the J school, right? These are all different authors of the first five books. Um, but for all their many differences, they kind of converge on this notion that God and humans have a special relationship because they have something in common, right? That's that aftermarket animacy. And the, everything else becomes a tool and not its own self. Now there's a bit of, so there's a couple of exceptions in what is commonly called the wisdom literature. Um, for instance, God's answer to Job or some of the Psalms. Those are sources for another time, but I can say, I, uh, I, I feel fairly confident in saying that the wisdom literature becomes sidelined in normative Jewish tradition. In other words, the God who tells Job, you know so much, where were you when I set up the world, that doesn't really become the dominant voice. Instead, this voice of do the commandments, and if you don't, right, I will bring the heavens to so expanding, however, our religious and scientific perspectives make this view and this whole paradigm um, start to seem incomprehensible. So I, I want to talk now about how these perspectives offer some challenges um, and opportunities for Jewish thought. So one of the key challenges that I've kind of been indicating here for Jewish theology is to grapple with the legacy of stories that imagine humans as not really earthbound, right? And one of the ways we can do that is by listening to other stories about what it means to be in the world. Um, I want to look at some of the stories behind the story that we know with a, with a technique that comes by way of the theorist Bruno Latour, a French sociologist who just died this past fall. And what I found so useful, what I find so useful about his um, work is how he helps me and us step outside of these kind of given categories, nature and civilization, as though they're stable, and instead helps us investigate how they mutually inform one another and why they emerge, okay? So let's apply this to our, our, our Torah. Uh, Latour suggests we ask, when faced with any worldview, what are these kind of constitutive elements that form the cosmos and the relative power of each thing to act, right? So for instance, I just described how God and the human being are very, very agentic, have lots of agency, and other things do not. Those things together constitute this kind of map of the world that Latour called a cosmogram. And he argued that any and every political and cultural formation implicitly produces a cosmogram. It's kind of the implicit set of answers to these fundamental questions of who are we, where are we, what type of space do we occupy? Whom do we kind of make the world with? And where?
where are we in time? So in the Israelite cosmogram, let's say, taking Genesis 1 and 2 again, humans and God are the only truly agentic being, beings. They're the only ones who can really act by exercising their will. The earth, the rain, the vegetation, the sky, the seas, they don't act out of their own power. And that's the key idea, right? They are caused to do something by God. They're the puppets, and God is the puppet master, right? And humans are unique in having something that enables them to either choose to do things one way or another, right? Nothing else has that capacity. Um, so the way to, one way to think about this is how God and the human creature become sort of excessively animated, and the rest of the cosmos becomes deanimated. Um, the majority of Tanakh texts, I think, or Torah texts at least, adhere to this cosmogram, and many biblical scholars have made this into kind of a virtue, one of the selling points, as it were, for the Bible, um, that, it, that it represents the kind of victory of what they might call a demythologized cosmos. So demythologization here is the mechanism by which these authors would, um, would sort of rewrite familiar stories in a way that cohered with this particular cosmogram they were trying to uh, kind of further. So for instance, in the ancient Babylonian epic, the Enuma Elish, we've got Marduk, the storm god, who vanquishes the primeval saltwater ocean, which is the female divine principle, Tiamat. And to, to give an example of demythologization, when Bible scholars talk about that, they say, well, the, the ancient Israelites took this Babylonian creation story, and they said, okay, well, there the forces of nature are gods. We don't like that idea. We think that this one god is the only god. And so they turned this, this ancient divine female principle, Tiamat, into its cognate term, Tehom, which is the Hebrew word for primeval uh, chaos that is in sort of this, the opening uh, verses of Genesis, right? Um, so, and meanwhile, Marduk, the storm god, who is kind of vanquishing the primeval chaos, right, becomes this wind that is hovering over the face of the deep, right? So you see there's this kind of structural parallel, but whereas in the ancient epic of Babylonia, those are, those are beings, those are you know, figures who have names and person personalities. Um, in the Torah, a single God controls the natural world. And that becomes, as I said, this kind of virtue. Um, the idea here is that biblical scholars, that especially in the modern period we hear this, biblical scholars and Jewish theologians have portrayed this as a morally better account than accounts in which other beings, other than humans, have agency. Um, so this demythologization functions as not just a descriptive term, but as a value claim, right? So we sometimes you might hear about this idea of like Israelite monotheism vanquishing pagan, uh, you know, nature worship or something. That's I see as a vestige of this this idea that right a deanimated world, a demythologized world, is the real world. The world that is kind of the world of common sense, right? The world of common sense is that only humans are animate, sentient, agentic creatures, right? And any other version has to basically be demythologized or secularized, otherwise it's, it's you know, not true. But rather than assuming that we know in advance what should or should not be assumed to have agency, right? what if we looked at it from a different point of view? And what if we thought of Torah's creation stories as deanimating the world, right? So um, when we have Tiamat becoming chaos, home, right? We what we're doing is we're taking the chaos and making it no longer a subject. Right? Um, this is not the only way to think about the world, right? There are other cosmograms out there. So, for instance, as Kimmerer, who I quoted before, Robin Wall Kimmerer, um, wrote about a kind of orientation to the world that comes from telling a tale in which Muskrat has a point of view. Right? In many Great Lakes origin stories, Muskrat 
negotiates with other deep divers to determine who's going to travel down into the primordial water to find out, to find the mud out of which to build a world, right? And Turtle offers its back, and Turtle Island is formed, right? So placing Jewish stories alongside these other stories and kind of sympathetically examining how they all imagine who has power in the world enables us to really start to challenge some some stories we have, and, and this is not to say that um, we simply adopt or adapt or appropriate those stories, but just to kind of start to mix it up. Um, in addition, right, so that's kind of a new perspective in religion that I think we have developed, and in science, of course, we have started to open up many new perspectives on animal communication and microbes and trees communicating, right, so that is, um, something I want to just uh, kind of give an example of this um, with octopuses, actually. So Cy Montgomery has written this book, The Soul of an Octopus, that tells us that an octopus can weigh as much as a man and stretch as long as a car, but can pour its baggy, boneless body through an opening the size of an orange. It can change color and shape. It can taste with its skin. It has three hearts. So many researchers have noted recently that octopuses forge relationships within and beyond their species, and they have distinctive personalities, and they can have likes and dislikes that they then execute, right? That they, they try to, to make real. Um, it seems pretty clear that octopuses, for one, have ways of ordering their worlds. So let's imagine for a moment the story of the world as told by octopuses. What would the octopus creation myth be? What kind of implicit octopus ethics would be encoded into its creation narratives? What kinds of cosmological frames would center octopus experience? Right? We're never going to know, but we can expect that the starring roles in octopus drama would go to octopuses, and that the heroes of octopus ballads would likewise be octopuses, and that octopus sensibilities and modes of experience in the world would privilege and center octopus reality. And isn't that what we have in these stories, right, of ours, that implicitly privilege and center the human experience, right? But that doesn't mean that's the only experience, right? And we could do that point of that thought experiment just as well in relation to the COVID-19 virus or a riverbank or a worm or a network of fungi, right? The ability to entertain these questions flows from a basic supposition we do not find in the Torah, which is that other inhabitants of the world have other subject positions. And for me, that is a critical, critical moment or place to kind of uh, dwell for a moment in order to get ourselves into this new conceptual framework that we need to have, right? That conceptual framework I recognize is not only not in Torah, but it might not be common sense for anyone else in this room. It took, it's taking me time, myself, absolutely, to kind of try to open up and experience this other way of thinking about other beings, right? But there are, we can posit this claim that there are points of view beyond the human and ask how other beings experience and represent reality and what their interests are and what they want, right? What's it like to be a bat? Which is a famous article uh, uh, by a philosopher, Thomas Nagel, but, you know, not only a bat, an octopus or a bacterium, right? We can posit that it's like something and that there are other consciousnesses and that they have points of view, right? They occupy the center of their own worlds, right? And what if we even considered for a moment that other phenomena might also be subjects beyond these particular things, right? Um, or animals, right? Consider for a moment the ground. In Torah accounts, the ground, right, which will swallow you up if you sin, right, is another demythologized or deanimated part of the world, right? This Torah's viewfinder is focused on humans, so it's not interested, right? It leaves fuzzy the other stuff. Um, but, you know, it's, it's more than that, and we are starting to understand this to our peril very late, right? What if we contemplated the land as an actor and 
realm as dynamic and heterogeneous? Right? What if instead of being just the furniture of the world that we, you know, act upon or sit on or whatever, right? What if the land itself is thought of as transitory and in motion, as degrading and building, as holding and exposing and wanting to move? So in a, a very powerful essay by the Puerto Rican Jewish writer, Aurora Levis Morales, um, which is called Nobody Owns It, Nadie La Tiene, she writes very eloquently of the mo movement of soil. And I want to sort of bring this toward a close with, with this thought experiment that she invites us to think about. Um, she says, this is her, in nationalist rhetoric, land does not move. No wonder it's so often portrayed as a mother. Eternal, loyal, and patient, it waits for its exiled children to come home. It would know them anywhere. But the real land, made of soil and rocks and vegetation, is never still. In the United States, the average acreage of land loses five tons of soil every year, blown by wind across property lines and fences, municipalities and national borders, washed by rain into river systems that drain a thousand miles downstream. Places have history, but soil does not have nationality. Just as the air we breathe has been breathed by millions of others first and will go on to be breathed by millions more, just as the water falls and travels, evaporates and circulates moisture around the planet, so the land itself migrates. The land itself migrates. The ground shifts beneath our feet, of course, not only because it's always been animate, but now because of earthquakes that are caused by fracking, because of the movement of industrial effluvia, and by spinning, bouncing, decaying isotopes that radioactive waste sets in motion. I don't call this kind of earthly animacy anthropogenic because it's not anthropos as a whole that has led to ecological disaster but rather specific societies that imagine their world as composed of inert, passive matter, or the ground as merely that which we walk on, right? It's those of us whose comfort is built on the subjugation of Earth and other beings who are finally learning the lesson that the Earth is animate. There are these other ways of comprehending the world, and we, as Jews, would do well to learn from them. How do we show up as Jews in this broader effort to reanimate the world, to recognize the animacy of the world that's being destroyed, destroyed by activities in which we are complicit? How do we start to do this? Well, as I said at the outset, this is in progress. It's not a one-person project. This is a project that we all have a, a, a role in thinking through. I think that Jewish thought can become earthbound when we admit and recognize the earth and its many sub organisms to be subjects as a gentic. Subjects as in subjects for thought, but also as subjects themselves. Can we become humble before and captivated by the intelligence of mycorrhizal networks, of lichen, of octopuses, right? When we do that, I think we'll be able to start entering into meaningful and curious dialogue with people who narrate the story of our world differently. I don't really know what Jewish thought is going to look like once we do this, but I know that engaging these questions will allow us to finally face the present and the future. Thank you.
big question, and I'm really glad you're writing a paper because it sounds like you have a lot of great ideas. Um, so I want to, um, I actually want to distance myself from the term animism because that term, in my reading as a thought of religion, is invented by basically European Protestants who are seeing people doing different things and saying, oh, they think that there are spirits in this, you know, uh, chair. Or they think mistakenly that there's a God in that, right? It's, a, it's part of a kind of colonial project of defining what religion is. So I don't love that term. Um, but I do think that thinking about animacy, I, you know, boy, uh, defeating eco-fascism, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm not it's sure it's up to that. I don't, <laughs> again, this is an all-in effort. So I do my little piece, and, and we all have to do our pieces. I'm not sure it can go fully there, but I do think that, you know, fascism and eco-fascism are, are so tethered to, you know, nationalism and white supremacy, and all of those, I think, are, are totally untenable if you, um, if you understand that you're not the only boss, right? That you're not the only actor. So, you know, we have a lot of work to do on many fronts, but I, I do think that, um, that there are deep level kind of tie-ins between recognizing that um, supremacy is, you know, this, this fantasy of some that, uh, that is totally, um, uh, upended by actually engaging the world with a, you know, a more capacious way of thinking. Yes? When you were uh, uh, talking about uh, the distinctions between God, nature, and God and humanity, uh, Spinoza's line popped into my mind. Uh, yes. Deus rather than as 
unified goals, right? Like that there are, there are always all of you know these different kind of pieces of ourselves, pieces of the world, and they don't always cooperate, they don't always line up, um, and that's kind of important to recognize so that we can take not collapse everything into a single narrative. It's so similar to Don't Look Up, but it's different. 
in that there, the meteor doesn't actually just explode the Earth. That's the difference, right? There's no spectacular moment. It's this, it goes on, but without us. Yeah, so how do we articulate what our, what our job is in light of that? That's, that's a big question. Yeah. Other folks? Yeah, uh, uh, Shami. <laughs>
it just seems so right for, um, for I don't even want to say misuse because intrinsically I think there are there are really unique challenges. So I, I'm not in love with thinking about apocalypse for a number of reasons, and what you just mentioned is certainly certainly out there. <laughs> um, I just want to, actually to go back to your question about um, who would have the reign. So I, I happen to have a little um, quote that I think is, is really lovely here from Bruno Latour. So the book is called Facing Gaia, Eight Lectures on the New Climatic Regime. Um, and he writes about the earthbound, like people who could really take this new um, mode of understanding ourselves as part of the world and not the only part. The earthbound understand that they will never play the roles of Atlas, right, holding up the world, or Earth Gardener. They will never be able to serve as master engineers of spaceship Earth, or even as modest and faithful guardians of the blue planet. It's as simple as that. They are not alone at the command post. I think we have time for one more question, if uh, anyone wants to pose one. All right, well, hearing none, please join me in thanking our speaker.